Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Discovery Multifamily Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Anthony Scandariato with Red Knight Properties. And today we have a special guest here with us, Jay Tenenbaum, who's the president of Scottsdale Real Estate Investments. And Jay, throughout his career, he's acquired over 450 distressed mortgage notes and real property in more than 30 states. He's got you know, over 20 years of experience as a former debt collector and he, you know, has a lot of legal know-how in terms of, um, you know, defaulted properties and how to turn them around into, you know, how to turn around the assets into positive cash flowing assets. Um, he specializes in um, mostly single family, but we're going to talk about that a little, well, one to four units, but we're going to talk about that a little bit more and why he, he does that. And he also, you know, is a national recognized speaker. He's been on various different podcasts. I see, you know, Joe Fairless, et cetera, Whitney Sewell. And um, he's considered an es- expert in discounted mortgages and obviously real estate investing as a whole. So really excited to have Jay on my show today and uh, it, it, looking forward to a fruitful discussion. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So tell us about, we were talking a little bit before the show, why you are investing in notes as opposed to you know, the hard assets from the, you know, that aren't defaulted and um, kind of, you know, talk about how that is different from a lead generation standpoint. How are you sourcing, you know, your note deals as opposed to, you know, everybody in, in real estate, if they're looking to buy existing cash flowing assets, they usually work with the broker to find them their opportunities. Who, who do you work with to find your, you know, defaulted note opportunities? Good question. So first of all, I'd like to start off by saying that I'm lazy. And I don't like to hunt. So since I just first started in this space, um, I had the opportunity to create relationships with banks and hedge funds all over the country. Continue to cultivate that in the you know eight years of slow. I've been doing I've been doing this. Um, so I get the you know available mortgage notes on spreadsheets sent to me on you know a very regular basis. And also you know we've got created relationships where if I need to find some assets or we always have a need to find assets, I can dial up some people that I know and say, hey, what do you have available? Because I've been very fortunate that a lot of the relationships that I have, um, I consider them you know, what we call a forward flow, which means I could buy and have bought from certain uh, relationships like on practically a monthly basis, right? Maybe one, maybe five, maybe 10, it just all matters what, what works, what goes through our model, our diligence and passes. But for the most part, I can go and get stuff from from the same uh, hedge fund on a pretty regular basis, and you know because we because we look we close. I mean that's the first thing in, in this business. When you when you say have a track record of closing on time, people want to do business with you. Um, so that's kind of how the sourcing started um, in that respect. And you know, looking at notes against property secured uh, by you know single family one to four units just became the niche, became the bread and butter. Um, it's not that I've, I don't know multifamily, I really don't, but um, it's just kind of the, what, what I can, what I've been able to build a business from is seeing those type of bat, no, notes in an asset class. So what do you do after you acquire the note with the property? So, um, well, in the note space that we figured out kind of facetiously, there's like almost 17 uh, different exit strategies available, right? Anywhere from- What's your favorite? What's my favorite? Um, it's evolved. Uh, the favorite started out back in 13, 14, 15, et cetera, um, because of my legal background, that I was buying mortgage notes, low value properties, houses were worth 50,000 ish, whatever, all over the country, mostly in the Midwest. And my strategy was I only wanted assets that were occupied because I wanted somebody to talk to. I got lonely, right? I wanted to somebody to talk to. So I was really just generating, uh, turning, you know, getting the borrowers in those homes. Um, doing low mods right and left and creating cash flow. And there was, you know, several reasons that that evolved. Um, first of all, like it, before I got into notes, you know, I'd been to hotel ballrooms and all that kind of stuff, wanting to get into real estate and the education would be great, but come Monday morning, well, I struggled with where do you find a deal? And when I got involved in, in the mortgage notes, I was like, okay, now rather than out going out there door knocking necessarily, I can buy mortgage notes. Now I have the same acquisition strategy, you know, a different acquisition strategy, same result. I was going to fix and flip it or whatever. Right. And then I realized, well, in my debt collection practice, um, I, you know, over the course of years had built up a pretty, you know, substantial cash flow 
wage garnishments, you know, bank levies, state, you know, payment plans, et cetera, that, you know, on a consistent basis, we're doing, you know, pretty well on a cash flow basis. So I'm like, you know what? That's what I know. That's what I handle. You know, why don't I just replicate, you know, generating cash flow? The easiest way to do that was with loan mods. And, um, you know, and I developed a kind of a, a, what I like to call, well, there's always stories behind your, your, your borrowers, right? Everybody's got a story. But basically, my, my approach was I would call up a borrower. Granted, I have a debt collection background. It's not something for your listeners that I say, go out and do it yourself because, the, you know, there's federal regulations, et cetera, that can get people in a lot of trouble. And I don't promote that in, when, I, when, I, when I speak to people. Um, that's one area that I just won't share just because I don't want to get taken out of context and since somebody gets sued for FDCPA violations. But essentially, I would call you up. Hey, Anthony, I'm, you know, Jay Tenenbaum. I own the mortgage at your house. How can I help you? And there's like 30 seconds of, of, of silence because nobody's ever asked them that before, right? And from there, they get their confidence in their, in, 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 you know, under their belt. They're like, then they vomit their country western song on me. And everything, they tell me everything about them and what happened and why it happened and everything else. But in that conversation, it's, I can afford to pay you $300 a month. And I probably bought the loan for like 10 grand. So rather than a big bang that had to wait, well, go to the investment committee, I'm like, gee, when I t I've got you on the phone. Would I take a 36% return? You bet. And that's basically how I would do it. Right. No, that's, that's excellent. So it, the, the one to four unit properties or, or notes, um, obviously, and, and you still have your criteria in terms of note size and, and whatnot. So are you still doing that five to 10 type, you know, deals a month or, you know, cause obviously I think the lower unit count, you know, in general, the more deals you have to do in order to scale your business. So what are you doing now? And have you really, it sounds like you're, you're keeping with that strategy. So I'm just, I'm curious if that's like the leads that you're getting and you're sticking to what you know, cause you're good at it or like what, you know, I guess. So what, no, actually we, 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 we've evolved. Um, okay. We, there you, go. you know, yeah, we've, we've evolved substantially in, in what we do. Um, just kind of figuring out how to do, well, how to evolve, how to scale. I mean, it's the most important. So, yeah, I mean, with my debt collection background, I obviously knew volume, knew how to understand volume, but that's, it's a grind. It really is. I mean, I own, you know, hundreds of notes at, at one given time, and it's a grind. Um, around 2017, we kind of paused on buying notes because the pricing got a little too high, and we started buying properties, right, off auction.com, et cetera. We bought like 40 properties in about six months. Kept them from some of them rentals, did some flips, whatever. Um, and then around 2019, uh, about early 2020, after around the pandemic, you know, mortgage notes became priced appropriately. But we were starting to buy. Uh, we had some. We, one of our hedge funds had relationships uh, with the relationships we had. We were getting um, late stage foreclosure reverse mortgages. So obviously, doing a loan mod was not possible because the borrower was dead. But and we also were buying higher value asset classes. We we evolved into that higher space. So when you're buying low value stuff, right? You want to buy multiple pools at a time because you want to diversify your risk. If I'm buying a property, I'm spending 75 to 120, you know, million dollars, whatever, on on note on higher value mortgage notes, you're okay. You got more spread in there. So um, we started buying higher value mortgage notes, starting you know, more profitability involved. Um, returns were fine. Returns were great because we we're getting really a good discount still. But for the most part, um, in the last year, year and a half plus, our notes that we buy, um, we're either getting taken out at auction. Um, the balance that we're owed. Remember, we're buying this at a steep discount. Um, for example, we bought a note in January in uh, Massachusetts, and we bought it for three hundred fifty thousand dollars. And the unpaid payoff balance was about seven hundred thousand. And it was supposed to go to auction uh, in May. And our investors decided they wanted to control the auction and take it back to flip. It was worth about six fifty, right? We knew we could put about hundred grand into it, own it for three fifty, put hundred grand into it, sell it for six fifty. That's the kind of deals we were getting our access to. Well, right before the May foreclosure sale, the borrower went, went bankrupt, right? With Chapter Thirteen, fine. Get, got out of bankruptcy really quick. Sale went, went. Sale was held in July. Now at this point in time, our investors decided, you know what? Let's see what we can do. The market had changed a little bit. We knew we were getting paid off at auction pretty regularly for prices that make no sense. 
And um, so while we were owed 700,000, right? And if, if we would have gone to sale in May, we would have you know, put the bid at 650 and, and nobody with the right mind would have bought the property, you know, third party bidder would have bought it. This time we decided, let's set it at 500,000, right? If we get it, we get it. If we don't, you know, we'll get it back. Somebody paid, bid 500,000. So we're still waiting to get paid on that through all the legal procedures after that. But for the most part, some, some third party bid 500,000, we're getting taken out. Um, so that's pretty much what we do. If we don't get, if we don't get paid off at auction, then we will do, for the most part, we're doing flips. Okay, excellent. So there's 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 no really strategies where you're holding on to the properties for long term. No, we've got a couple that um, uh, we bought one note in Baltimore when we took it back. Um, we realized that the, that the repairs that we needed, the flips, wasn't going to make much sense. So we are holding up, rehabbing that for for, for keeping it as a rental. And when we once we finish it, um, we'll refinance it out and probably pull most of our cash out because on the mortgage side you rate you're, you're acquiring your notes raising private capital there isn't any institutions that finance no purchases but once you own it as a note and own it as a property then you've got financing available so we'll take we'll we'll take we'll cash out take most of our capital out and just hold it as a rental for the wall and maybe sell it after as a rental down the road got it so would you say your your average loan size is around that you know you mentioned 350 or you know Five hundred thousand dollar range right now that you're taking over, or, or what? It bear it varies. Um, you know, hundred thousand dollars. I mean, we're just we're look we're looking at the higher value asset class. I think the values of our houses are probably two fifty and up. You know, from fifty to two fifty <laughs> a few years later. Yeah, exactly right. Um, big di big difference there. Um, so what does your team look like? Um, I'm just curious on the operations side. You know, there's a lot of different build outs for just regular real estate operators, you know, investing in the hard asset. So what is, what does your mortgage, you know, note team look like? Like, are you the forefront? You have other people, like, what does it look like? Yes. Yes. So in this space, you can go a long way with outsourcing to your third party vendors. And like I said, we've invested in, I've invested in over 35 states since the course of my career. And the majority of that is outsourcing. I mean, I've outsourced my, Diligence vendors, my you know my O and E, my my title report guys, my tax guys, um, uh, my custodian, my servicers. You know, once I own the stuff, my realtors and contractors um, are very key, getting me valuations and and we're doing rehab if I need to, um, in certain areas. And then you know the ancillary vendors from from there. Um, but in the past year, we've grown as a company. Um, we've got uh, you know our outsourcing, our financial team. Well, not outsourcing. We've added, you know, in-house financial team. We've added, added um, you know, uh, analysts. You know, my partner used to do a lot of the you know, upfront analytics, and now he's got a team of two or three individuals who do the um, the, the analytics. Where we're doing diligence on stuff that we want to buy. Um, once we own it, um, I have an a, a asset manager, and I actually just added another another person um, as well. Um, and then we've got uh, uh, a variety of other. We've added a person to dedicate sourcing and marketing. Also, we got two, we had two people there because um, really in our space, there's pretty much like four pillars of where you need. You need the operation side, to the, to the, like any business, your non-asset related events. Um, you need sourcing, right? I mean, I've got relationships, but you can never have too many relationships. Um, you need capital raising, which is pretty much what I do. Um, and then you need the, the, the you know, the, the um, asset management side, right? And so you kind of just fit your organization inside of, inside of that. So, I mean, you got your marketing funnels and your, you know, to rate, help you raise your capital. You got your sourcing to help you rate, you know, help you find your sourcing. Um, and then you got to manage what you, what you got. And, you know, on, on a, on an asset management, getting it through foreclosure, et cetera, now. And then on the back end, once you, you take it back as a property, you're doing, you know, figuring out what your exits are and, and dealing with your third party vendors all across the country. Excellent. So very similar to standard real estate operators. Um, in terms of the pillars of the company. So, so Jay, can, can you explain a little bit more and how the foreclosure moratoriums have impacted your business and if it's still ongoing? Um, good question. We keep a very watchful eye on the moratoriums. So here, so here's, so here's the thing. Um, the short answer is we did not buy that at that that note in Massachusetts for probably six to nine months before we, when we first saw it. 
because the moratorium was in place, we, we, we just couldn't justify uh, raising $350,000 with investor capital and sitting on it for six to nine months until the moratorium was lifted. The moment we found out the moratorium lifted, then we locked it down, then we did our diligence, finished our diligence, and, and, and then uh, pulled the trigger and bought it at like the end of December. Um, but for the most part, um, there's several tiers. The mortgages we buy are not the federally, typically are not the federally backed kind. So the federal moratoriums do not apply to us. They never have, right? And that's just with the stuff, not, not, with the, not the stuff we're buying. So we were, um, keep a watchful eye on the particular state moratoriums, right? Because if the state imposed moratorium, foreclosure moratoriums, we had to follow suit with that. And really, Illinois is really the only one that still kind of keep, you know, kicking our butt a little bit on, on, on their stuff. I mean, in Illinois, Illinois, I've got a love-hate relationship with Illinois. I, I do really well monetarily when I invest there, but just their procedures, their bureaucracy just fries me. Like right now, uh, we've got a note on a duplex. It's not owner-occupied, and yet we can't go to foreclosure because they still consider it occupied. You know, um, it's typically a commercial note because the owner does live there, but, you know, they see it differently. Um, so yeah, for the most part, we want to be able to, you know, uh, the way we structure our company as we would continue to evolve, um, we used to do, you know, work with one investor per asset kind of deal, right? Like a joint venture. Um, as we got in the higher price points, um, we started doing syndications, right? We've done like 19 syndications this, this year already, um, in some of our note purchases. Um, so yeah, so that's. So that's kind of how, you know what everything evolves. And with that, um, we also have a credit facility. So basically, if we don't get paid off at auction and we get the property back, we can utilize our credit facility and then return about 70, 90% of our, our investors' capital back to them with kind of basically doing delayed, what we call a delayed purchase. And, I, and, I say, and there's a distinction with that because if I own it for five minutes and want to refinance what I already own, then I'm only getting 75 to 80% of leverage. With a delayed purchase, it's like a bridge loan. I'm getting, you know, like a fixable bridge loan. I'm getting 90% of acquisition, 100% of rehab that I'm going to need, and that and that still allows that to return the investor's capital. Yeah, yep. It's all about protecting the investor's capital. And you mentioned you did um, a mortgage syndication. What, uh, at what loan amount was that? Did that structure make sense for you to to do that? Because you mentioned you would just mostly joint venture deals when you're when you're getting in in, in the six in the six figure range of, of you know whether it starts with a one or a five it doesn't really matter um you know it just gets to a point where you know if you're raising fifty thousand hundred thousand yeah you've got investors that say sure i'll write a check but when you get a little higher than that you're like well i i, I you price it just like just like affordability and everything else in real estate you price them out of the market they love the deal but they don't have that kind of money so we just fine we'll prepare us and we and knew, we knew once we got to the higher asset per you know acquisition numbers that we need to do that right um absent of you know a formal fund you need to do that no absolutely absolutely very interesting stuff jay how can my audience uh find you uh learn more about your platform and uh potentially invest with you so um our, our website www.scottsdalerei.com rei stands for real estate investment not the camping store um my phone number, which I will answer, 714-458-6317. Um, my email is jay at scottsdalerei.com. Excellent. And what I'll do is I'll provide a link to, that was very generous, your, your phone number, your, your website, and everything else you just mentioned in our social media description and on iTunes. And if you liked what you heard and or saw today, if you can please give us a rating and review on iTunes, uh, preferably, that, that would be appreciated. It helps Jay and myself get our message out to a greater audience. So really appreciate that. And very interesting and, and fruitful conversation, Jay. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Anthony. Thanks for having me.